So for the past six weeks, we have been looking at the Gospel of Luke. And Luke highlights throughout his Gospel how Jesus came to reach the outcasts, the sinners, the tax collectors, the Samaritans, the lepers, everyone who was regarded as an outsider. For Luke, Jesus lifting up the lowly is the focus of his gospel account. We see this in the very beginning chapters of Luke, that purpose being made clear, lifting up the lowly. Mary, on finding out that she's pregnant with Jesus, proclaims these incredible words. For God has pulled down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. In his death, Jesus is counted as a common criminal, identifying with the lowly. And in his resurrection, Luke highlights God's final act of lifting up the lowly. Not only is lifting others up Jesus' mission, it's also the mission of all of us who follow Jesus as well. During the past few weeks, we have made both an online and an in-person display of things that we would do to lift others up and things that lift us up. You can see the online word cloud on our social media And on the screen, you can see a picture of what is in the back in our gathering space on the wall. You can add to it today if you'd like, if you're here in person. Um, There are sticky notes and markers. On the left side is what will you do to lift others up? And on the right side of the display is what lifts you up. Luke's gospel highlights how Jesus came to lift up the outcasts, the outsiders, and the outlaws. And we see this emphasized in Luke's telling of the Easter story. You see, Luke's version of the Easter story, more than any of the other gospel accounts, recalls the importance of women in the ministry of Jesus. Prior to the resurrection morning, Luke makes sure to mention many times the importance of women who were present at the arrest and the crucifixion of Jesus. These same women followed Joseph of Arimathea, who's a Pharisee who arranged for Jesus' burial. They followed him to the tomb and they witnessed Jesus' body being laid in it. Luke is leaving no doubt that this is an important detail for him. Then, Luke says, the women went home and prepared spices and oils to anoint the body after the Sabbath. In Luke's telling of the story, he makes sure that we know that these women continued to care for and support Jesus even after his death. And Luke begins his telling of the Easter story with a group of women, not just Mary, as in John's gospel, but a whole group of women going to the tomb, finding it empty, the angels telling them that Jesus had been raised. Luke even goes further. He tells us the names of some of the women. You know, throughout the Bible, there's a lot of stories about women, but a lot of times, close to 70% of the time, they're not given any names. They're just Some woman said this. But Luke says there is Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, Mary Magdalene, and he includes this detail, half a sentence in verse 10. He says this, and the other women who were with them. This group of women not only became the first to hear the good news of Jesus' resurrection, they also became the first to proclaim the good news. Luke tells us that they go back to the disciples and they tell them what they had seen and heard from the angel. And Luke adds these words, the words struck the apostles as nonsense and they didn't believe the women. In the first century, women were not regarded as reliable witnesses. Even back then, women were often not believed when they spoke up. Yet God chose these women to bear witness first. 
lifting them up with the privilege of being the first to hear and proclaim the good news of the resurrection. Luke's version of the Easter story with these women as the first witnesses is yet another reminder of Jesus' mission and God's purpose to lift up the lowly. As Jesus' followers, it is our mission as well. The resurrection changed everything for Jesus' followers. When they saw defeat in Christ's crucifixion, the resurrection brought about victory, promise, and hope. The New Testament has many different ways of explaining the meaning of Jesus' death and resurrection. One key metaphor which recognizes the importance of Christ's resurrection as well as his death is called Christ the Victor. On the cross, Jesus battled the forces of evil, sin, and death. When Jesus died and was buried, it appeared that evil and death had won. But in the resurrection, Jesus demonstrated victory over death, evil, and hatred forever. Death cannot contain Christ. In the resurrection, life and light have the final victory. I want to give thanks to Luke and Bridget Smith for sharing this photo that you see on the screen from their very recent trip to Italy. It was a couple weeks ago that they were there. This is a painting about Christ the victor, and it's found inside the Duomo Cathedral in Florence, Italy, painted on the ceiling. People can actually climb the Duomo and get really close to the paintings. Bridget and Luke did that, and many years ago, I did it as well with my grandfather. What does the resurrection mean? Author and theologian Frederick Beekner puts it this way, resurrection means the worst thing is never the last thing. The worst thing is never the last thing. I invite you to say that out loud to your neighbor if you have someone sitting around you, or if you're watching from home and you're all by yourself, just say it out loud. Tell your neighbor, the worst thing is never the last thing. Death, difficulties, evil, sickness, violence, tragedy will not have the last word. The resurrection of Jesus Christ shows us that in the end, life triumphs over death. This is the hope and promise of Easter. This is God's ultimate lifting up of the lowly, which includes you and it includes me. The truth is, life also includes crucifixion moments. Over the past few years, this truth has been made all too real to us. With a global pandemic, the ravages of climate change, with wars and racism and sexism and homophobia, with the plague of violence, which so recently traumatized our community right here in East Lansing, and it goes on with Nashville and others, with the grief still raw in our hearts and the tears still on our cheeks, we know all too well that life has its moments of suffering and adversity, defeat and death. But life also includes resurrection. Where life and joy and hope come out of tragedy and defeat, the central claim of the Christian faith contained in Easter is this. In the end, resurrection has the final word. We live both the crucified and the resurrected life. In the resurrection, God demonstrates for good that life and love and light have defeated tragedy and evil and death forever. In Jesus, God came to lift up the lowly, and the resurrection is God's ultimate act of lifting up the lowly, bringing life out of death and light out of despair. This is our hope as Easter people and it's our calling to go out and live with this hope as the center of our lives, bearing witness to the resurrection and bringing good news because Easter means that the worst thing is never the last thing. As a pastor, one of the things that I do is officiate at funerals. My first appointment to a local church was back in 1991. Do the math and you see that it's been a while, and since 1991, I have officiated hundreds of funerals. Sometimes there's a casket, 
Sometimes there's not. Sometimes the person who has died has lived a long and full life, and sometimes they've just had a few hours, months, years of life. Sometimes there's the service in a sanctuary. Sometimes it's at the gravesite in a cemetery. Sometimes it's out in a memorial garden. Or as was the case during the shutdown time of the pandemic, sometimes it's even been in a digital space like Zoom. As every person is unique, no two funeral services are ever the same. And yet... In the hundreds of services I have conducted, there is a time in each and every service where it is proclaimed in word, in song, in scripture, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. In the face of death, This is the core essence of what the church has to say. Dying, Christ destroys our death. Rising, Christ restores our life. I am the resurrection and the life. I have literally said these words standing in a cemetery with a fresh grave right at my feet and the coffin about to be placed in the tomb. I am the resurrection and the life. These words are part of the official liturgy in our book of worship. At a funeral, we we don't proclaim it was God's will, or they're better off now, or death is a natural part of life. Instead, in the very face of death, we proclaim, I am the resurrection and the life. Preacher and writer Jennifer Lord of Austin Presbyterian Theological Seminary in Austin, Texas, writes of the preacher's task at a funeral in this way. She says, this is what we pastors do and have done century after century in every corner of the globe, no matter the season, no matter the cause of death. We stand at the graveside with the deceased before us while proclaiming, I am the resurrection and the life. We proclaim resurrection in the presence of death. Now, this proclamation in no way denies the power of death sting. It doesn't pretend that our life of struggling and sufferings are non-existent. It doesn't erase pain and indignities and violence and oppression. It just means that while these things might be our reality right now, they don't and they won't have the last word. So this is why, even in the face of the despicable actions which took place in the Tennessee House of Representatives on Thursday, I choose to believe that when people try to expel some people from their rights, when they try to silence their voices, the resurrection will have the final word. In fact, we can see already the rising of these young, articulate black men who have conducted themselves in amazing ways to bring to light the truth, to bring to light the truth that violence and racism will not have the final word. I am the resurrection and the life. You see, we live in a very broken world. We struggle, but we live with hope. Hope in the coming good news because we know that the worst thing will not be the last thing. Theologian Kate Bowler puts it this way, sometimes we get lucky. And everything makes sense. We get the answers we need, or the treatment works, or the finances add up, or the prodigal returns home, or the marriage is restored, or the pregnancy test is exactly what we hope for. But many times, nothing makes sense. Our hearts are broken beyond repair. We toss and we turn in our unsolvable grief. The people we love are lost. The rug is yanked out from under our feet. We live in the already and the not yet kingdom. 
because of what Jesus did in his life and death and resurrection, we know the fullness of God's justice and love and redemption will be accomplished. But it's not yet our reality. So we live at the graveside, proclaiming the hope, I am the resurrection and the life. The resurrection is God's final act of lifting up the lowly. In the resurrection, Jesus defeats death and evil for good. And what that means for our lives and for the world is that we are, in fact, being restored in Christ for the life of the world. What that means for us, for you and me, is that we are called to stand together and proclaim resurrection as a counterproposal to all the evidence at hand. What that means is that we, as Easter people, are called to go, like the women who went to the tomb and shared this good news. And if people don't believe you, if they think it's nonsense, just keep on proclaiming it. Just keep on proclaiming it. We are called to live with this hope at the center of our lives. This is the final word and the way forward because God has defeated death and evil by raising Jesus from the dead. This is what Easter means. This is what Easter is, and it makes all the difference. Happy Easter. He is risen. Alleluia. Amen.